So I'm pleased to introduce our featured speaker, Mary Rickle Peltier, um, will be is joining us today to talk to us about um, how her work using NELF Explorer and advancing conservation. Mary is the founding director of Park Watershed, which is a 501c3 urban suburban environmental stewardship organization. She, her background is in architecture. She has a bachelor's of architecture from Rhode Island School of Design and a master's of design from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Mary is co-leading a NELF working group in partnership with Trinity College, Connecticut River Conservancy and Sustainable Connecticut. Their project explores how urban suburban riparian corridors offer uniquely vital ecosystem service benefits within high density urban suburban communities that deserve increased protections. And I just also want to express personal gratitude to Mary, something that I've really learned from her via this, via this network and these conversations and, and this group is about the importance of thinking about our urban landscape, um, how, it, how we can't just conserve the rural landscape in isolation of thinking about um, the places where people live as well. Um, so the title of Mary's talk today is Watershed Planning to Protect and Revitalize Riparian Corridors along the Lower Connecticut River. And so with that, I will hand it over to Mary. I'm gonna unmute and that's my screen share. And now you will see this, but I wanna to move to the presentation. Oops, I have to go to this. Um, excuse me for just a minute while I um, pick the, um, we're gonna do the slideshow view. And how's that? Do we've got the start? All right, good, good. So again, as Marissa said, I'm Mary Rickle Pelletier, and um, most of my work has recently has been focused on the evolution of park water and shed and urban suburban 501c3 um, to conserve the watershed of the Hartford area, but especially the stream corridors. And just to give everyone a sense of where that is, the Lower Connecticut. Um, actually, I don't know officially, I think it where the break in what the lower Connecticut is, but uh, you know, most of the state of Connecticut is within that lower Connecticut area. And as you can see from the map here that the Park River Regional Watershed is a relatively small 78 square mile watershed nestled into um, the Hartford um, metro area. So of course, all the red is the developed land and um, this is New Haven uh, and Waterbury. And for most of the 21st century, a lot of these areas were considered um, throwaway. When I first started this work, I had someone explain to me who was within the conservation community that Hartford was a throwaway watershed. And at that point in time, you know, a lot of the architects, the architectural community was talking about how there's no way, there's no, there's no throwaway. And um, so that was really shocking. And it, it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I think it, it reflects how the need um, and the evolution of change. So most of the protection, you know, when we think of the Environmental Protection Agency, we think of that big word protection. And of course, when we look at the Connecticut River watershed here on the right, we could see that there's a lot of landscapes that do need protection. And of course, there's monumental waterways like the Long Island Sound. And those really came first in the environmental movement. Um, but here we are now in the 21st century, 20 years into the 21st century, and we're drilling down and in, 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 into our urban suburban areas. And this uh, land map, land use map was made in uh, probably maybe 15 years ago or so. And you can see these pixels. It's, it's still a pretty coarse map. And it, I think to some extent, it's similar to the NELF um, Explorer tool. And, um, and so, you know, if you were looking for places to protect, you would probably focus on, on the ridges. This is where uh, landscapes along the water, drinking watersheds have been protected, rather than than these splotches, which are unconnected and fragmented. And so most people, when they see that red, they think it's all parking lot, and you can understand why um, people who are, are just 
getting a grip on what to conserve might overlook this area. But these little parcels of land here, this one in particular, if you can see that squiggle, that's actually the landscape behind me. Let's see if I can get my hand in the picture. So right behind me, that stream corridor, that focus, that photograph was taken right back here. And this tiny little dot, it's not even showing up, is this photograph here where the duck is. Uh, a beautiful little urban wild in my, in my neighborhood, which many people walk to briefly, like I can go out for lunch and within five minutes have this experience where we've seen bear, um, wood duck, um, ducks, of course, um, deer, uh, and uh, some people have seen bobcat in this area with a bobcat and her kit more um, tracked um, in this area. So even though it's way at the end of the city, uh, in the city limits, um, it's, it's, uh, it's got, somebody's got their, uh, right, a reminder to, to mute and thanks for joining us. Yeah, check, check your mute. Um, so again, here's the Park River Regional Watershed. This is the Meta Comet Ridge along the top, of course, the, we're, we're, the Farmington River Watershed, a much more well-known watershed, wraps around um, uh, the Park River Watershed. And the focus of my work has largely been on the north branch of the Park River. So this photograph here is Hugh Blind Tower, which is about there on the Meta Comet Ridge, and we're looking east across the watershed to the city of Hartford, uh, the, the skyline at that location, which is here along the Connecticut River. The Connecticut River isn't clearly delineated in this map, but you can see that the town boundaries are the Connecticut River. And uh, the Park River Regional Water, Park River itself is actually fairly well known for having been buried. Um, and it's buried under I-84. I and so all those curvy roads that you go over, if you ever take I-84 through, through Hartford, um, that's because of that, they, they buried the river in order to have the land to put the highway. Um, so that, that, land, that river or the, the 78 square mile basin pours into the Connecticut River at that location. So Again, my focus has been the North Branch, which is the 28, the northern 28 square miles. And that area um, is because it was once a Class A water shed. It was, it was designated in the state of Connecticut as a Class A water quality, and yet that's deteriorated. Um, it, but the DEP in 2008 determined after we had SEP funds, that this was an area where they could possibly retrieve the water quality. So I'm just gonna go through what the sub-basins are. This is the main stem, this is the primary focus of the work that I've done. And these are um, Washbrook, Beeman's Brook, Philly Brook, Tumble Brook. Um, and um, so the, the main stem is an impaired uh, waterway. And it's important to note that Bloomfield as you can see in the pie chart, is 68% of the watershed is really coming from an upstream municipality. And so we, we depend on what happens in Bloomfield for water quality. Um, but the North Branch is an impaired water way, and it's been hard to get this message across about the importance of water quality when it's already impaired. Um, but one of the things we learned in doing this work is when we conserve landscape around our waterways, and you can see, I think, I don't know where people's galleries are located, but um, the green indicates that in water quality testing, that the, that water quality seemed to improve itself because of the presence of trees and forest and stream buffers. So there, there wasn't a need to go back to the top of the watershed in order to um, move forward, uh, in, in order to improve the water quality. There was a need to conserve the land. So this is a winter picture, so it doesn't look like it's that stunning. But again, behind me is the same segment. That's, that photograph behind me is taken uh, about right here where it says NRP where my, um, my cursor is. So that was 
positive findings because it what it does is it allows people in cities, people in high density urban areas to improve water quality through their conservation efforts and through their um, land management practices. Um, but downstream of there, you know, um, there's lots that the government can do in terms of, um, of managing um, discharges. But again, the citizens can move forward with land conservation and again, management strategies. So and just a reminder, probably many people are, you know, a lot of our focus was on green infrastructure for the work the Park Watershed has done. Um, but, you know, what green infrastructure does for us within an urban area is essentially takes that floodplain, which is, you know, historically a longer, wider floodplain, and then it condenses it and folds it into substrata, uh, eight to 10 feet in some areas in order to capture the stormwater runoff from um, the overflow of uh, parking lots and rooftops. Um, so it's, so doing that work um, gave me a sense of how critical uh, these stream buffers were and how critical the widths of them were along the stream corridor. And I also begin to notice that the, the stream corridor, the riparian corridor, as you can see along here, had a robust amount of trees in comparison to our city park. So here's our city park. Here, Elizabeth Park, this park is over 100 years old. Um, and it's increasingly being managed by, uh, you know, excessive mowing, but also um, this, uh, these ball fields, these athletic fields, a baseball field here, there's a baseball diamond here, there's a baseball diamond here, this is a tennis court, there's a tennis court over there, there's a football field in Keeney Park. There's a, I was a parks commissioner in the city of Hartford. So what I'm seeing is that the leagues, which are politically very powerful, really want and need open space to play. And we want recreational options in cities that create community. But meanwhile, along the North Branch, these old trees are aging and maturing and they're not necessarily hazards to anyone. They're just overlooked. This is a, a, a major commuter road. This is Asylum Avenue. And um, I will go back to that. That tree is about right there. So the next slide where you, you'll see my arrow, that actually it's right there. You can see that parking lot. So that edge of the parking lot, that's the tree canopy we're going to see in the next photograph. And that tree canopy is, when we look closely at it, each of these limbs here, this is what I've learned from Dr. Susan Messino our, from Trinity College, each of these limbs is, is like a mature tree within the context of, a, of, a, of the city. And um, as we know, um, mature trees, they store carbon for decades, they generate oxygen, they host biodiversity, they mitigate the urban heat island, et cetera, et cetera. I'm thinking this group knows those lessons. And, um, and but in city parks and in the city, in, on street trees, these mature trees are hazards They're, or are perceived as hazards. So increasingly, especially after Hurricane Sandy, uh, trees have been cut down at alarming rates. And we're hearing this from people all over the state. And yet the municipal tree wardens are concerned about liability issues. And, you know, for instance, right along the Connecticut Historical Society, the municipal tree warden approved the, um, the removal of a mature um, elm tree because it was right over the parking lot and it was perceived as a threat, even though there was really nothing wrong with that tree. But she approved it and the historical society approved it, even though we know elm trees are valuable and you know, significant trees. So what do we get in replacement? So here's Elizabeth Park and here are the mature trees that are beginning to, to come down, the limbs are falling and we are, this, is being replaced, right? This is our replacement right here and right here. You, you can see these are 
make a lot of people happy planting trees, but these are cultivar trees from a nursery, whereas the trees that we see in the background are um, really from seed stock that was probably a pre-European um, tree. Uh, and I'm not a forester, so I can't confirm all that, but all of these parks are over 100 years old, and I'm, I'm guessing they, although I don't know, what, that they weren't bringing in, um, you know, unless they were ornamental trees, the native trees are related to the uh, pre-European st seed stock, and also are more likely um, to survive. So there's concern that the benefits of these smaller trees aren't really serving the they're, they're not providing the full life benefit of a tree because the tree isn't allowed to fall down and decay on the forest floor and uh, if it falls down in in a city park it's quickly removed and cleaned up and and um, uh, stump ground and so forth so here this tree is about five feet across and uh, it's just happily decaying in the forest in, along the riparian corridor. So the premise of the work of Park Watershed, which I really, to get to my point, so to speak, is that along the riparian corridor, you're probably gonna find that the dynamic life cycle of trees is, is able to um, happen and it's able to happen in relationship to the volatile and dynamic movement of the river, the seasonal movement of the river, and that all of those benefits are necessary benefits that provide resiliency to our ecosystem, as well as a whole host of benefits, including connectivity. So this is a map of, um, you know, people talk about connectivity of bicycle trails and so forth, but when we look at protected land, what we see is a patchwork of places rather than a kind of capillary network of riparian corridors with conserved landscapes around them. And that's what I'd like to change. I'd like to, uh, uh, this project let, would like to help people understand that we need to focus on, on those whole riparian corridors, which is tough. Um, and again, this is a kind of crude slide, but it, we often think of the, the riparian corridor, we think of rivers as useful things because we see them on maps as flat places. But when we look at the benefits of what they offer, and this I just kind of hastily put this together, it's of course a winter slide, but there's a host of things that are happening um, that converge along the riparian corridor that don't necessarily converge in other landscapes. So again, here's that tree and its benefits. And this presentation is really to remind people the evolution, even in cities, of our ecosystems. And this photograph that's just appeared from 1897 is that landscape. So over on the right here, that, that tree, this tree here, is either on this side or that side of the of this bridge, um, and this was the bridge. It was built in 1897. So it's hard to believe that that's what that that the Hartford landscape was so denuded of trees, even though the dioramas of the of the for Harvard forest um, show us that about the agricultural lands um, and why we need to be rethinking what our future landscapes are going to be. So. This is just a picture of the tool, which most people are familiar with. And of course there's that, but here's a screenshot of where forests are today. This is upstream of the segments that I've been showing you, but still within the main stem of the North Branch of the Park River. And you can see these uh, are considerable, you know, forested areas here uh, and over here. This is Keeney Park. Um, over on the left. So this is a conserved landscape from about 1890, 1880. And this is the uh, 1934 um, ortho of the area. So that's the same area. And you can see how many trees have returned since 1994. So follow my cursor along that corridor, along here, 
and then and then we go back to that photograph and that is where this area is so we have a considerable um, gain since 1934 uh, and, and that's documented and now how do we conserve it and that's part of the work is making the message we need to conserve this landscape and then the question is how do we conserve this landscape and we have to think of it as a beautiful place so this is a statement from 1883 uh, that may have been written uh, by Mark Tw Twain or Samuel Clemens because evidently he would pen statements and he reminds people in the city of Hartford not to call it the Hog River but to call it the Park River because the first park in the United States that was paid for by public funds was Bushnell Park, which is a tiny little speck of a park in downtown Hartford. And once that park was created, the Park River watershed gained its name instead of being called the Hog River anymore. So that's all written here. And here's the map, one of the earliest maps of that area that he refers to. Um, this is the uh, 1796 um, Morse map, the, one of the first maps of New England rivers. and um, and this is an image of the North Branch and the question of how do we go forward into the 21st century. And the issue is how do we conceive of it as a whole place worthy of conservation within the city limits. And I've put these two um, kind of comparisons up. This is Central Park in New York City. And this is um, Muddy, Muddy uh, River Commons in Boston. And so these are two Olmsted parks. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted was is born and he's buried in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, you, you know, having him as a kind of um, sounding board for how do we set aside landscapes within the context of the city, we look at, at the Muddy River Commons, the Muddy River the Fens, so to speak. And um, it's a squiggly place and it's not necessarily the same kind of landscape as Central Park. So what is, what is that boundary? What is that place? Do we need a, a perfectly square shape in order to get people to consider a, a place worthy of conservation? It's hard, I don't know the answers to that. So. Again, the work is, do we want a hog river? You want a park river? I think all of us, especially in cities, we want a scenic um, landscape. It of course has very many economic benefits like the, it, it'll increase real estate values. Um, it makes your communities more walkable. It has a, a wide range of eco service benefits. Of course, reducing the urban heat island, providing oxygen, reducing carbon dioxide, et cetera. And so, yeah, so that's the that's that's the work. I hope I was staying on time. I must say I didn't set aside my um, is it timing? Was I did good on timing? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mary. We have uh, we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. We have about another half hour. Good. Um, yeah. Um, so, so you want me to stop sharing, or you want me to keep this up? So if we if we go, people have questions about particular image images. Yeah, let's leave it up for now in case um, people have questions about a particular slide or um, or a slide is useful for answering questions. Yeah. So if anyone wants to um, start off with a question, um, you can either, you, you can, we do raised hands in this group, or you can unmute, or you could uh, use chat. We have a question from Ward J. Sorry, I don't know your uh, first name there, but they want to know if, is the river being used by school groups? It is actually. Um, in fact, the, thank you for asking me that question. Um, we just finished a report called uh, Learning How to Conserve and Revitalize the North Branch Park River 
Um, my work actually started because of the Annie Fisher School had wanted to create a nature trail along along the North Branch. And on one of the slides um, that I considered including, in fact, you know, I have all these extra slides. I'm gonna like, I don't know, let's see if I can like get, so these are all, sorry, these are all like slides you didn't get to see. And I'm gonna like boom through these. That That's Bushnell Park, by the way. And then see, and anyway, so, um, and it see that little speck right here. Um, this is diversion. That's Bushnell Park, our first public park. Anyway, um, oh, I took it out. Anyway, I used to have um, a picture of, um, I had a picture of, of all the schools. So there's 12 K through 12 schools. You can see on our website, Park Watershed, there's a report and they use the river in different ways. And one of the things we've learned, I'm gonna go backwards. I'll, I'll just leave this one up now. And actually this one is kind of better for the New England landscape futures because it emphasizes um, how design solutions um, are really our way forward. Um, so uh, the schools use the river in a wide variety of ways, but teachers all over the place are having a hard time getting out onto these nature trails. It, because um, the kids have to not get their shoes dirty, the weather's got to be good, even though it's an hour may seem like a long time, you've got to get everybody together and out the door. Um, if you, if, it, if the, all of, there's all, I think the 12K through 12 schools and the colleges, the university, the University of Hartford, UConn, law, law school, and um, the Hartford Seminary, they can, you know, they're not really using the rivers at all, but the big problem is just getting people out to them. And we have proposed that we, you, you develop a virtual nature trail so that enthusiasts um, can go out and set up the cameras or the monitoring devices. And then within the classroom, you can study the river by having a wildlife webcam or having a, a um, you know, using the stream gauges, that's a USGS gauge. So, I don't know, do you, uh, can I ask a question back to whoever asked the question? Ha, are they involved in schools? That person, they've left. <laughs> well, we'll see if, uh, if Ward J wants to answer that. Uh, give him a second or maybe they'll, uh type of response, but we have a few other questions in the chat if, if you'd like Go to answer it. those in the meantime. Yeah. Should I look for them? Um, so this is a question from Heidi Ritchie at Mass Audubon. Uh, she was wondering if all of the, oh, it's Jeff Ward, not involved in uh, schools, uh, but is my tech who has patience is. <laughs> so <laughs> tangentially involved in, in schooling. Uh, I, th I think in urban areas, there's a lot of schools along rivers. And once again, an unutilized resource for STEM education. But I think we're approaching it by thinking we need to build a nature trail, which is very expensive, very difficult to maintain, very diff difficult for teachers to get out. So we need to change that mindset. We need a nature trail and ask, how can we bring nature into the classroom and get you know, unique um, smaller groups of people, you know, parents, kids, scout groups that help make those um, connections. Great. So Heidi's question is, are all of the undeveloped remaining pieces of riparian corridors in the city public parkland or are some still privately owned? And if so, are there any efforts underway to protect and connect those pieces of land? So there's the Another reason why it's hard to conserve the land is it's a it's a mosaic of property ownership, and uh, I'm not a lawyer by training, um, but you know many of these land records go back hun you know over a hundred years, and so to understand how to make the conservation, um, you know to conserve the land. Uh, you have to do all this land records and surveys and evidently uh, these title searches are so um, elaborate and specialized legal work that there's a company in Chicago that does, you know, I mean, somebody, an engineer told me that once and I was like, really, is that, is it that hard? 
And, um, but there are, there are definitely efforts to conserve the river underway and to help people understand um, the, its values. You know, how do we, you know, how can we value it? Because that's the other piece of it is, is how do you conserve it in a, in, within an urban context so um, that it, it, it creates value rather than, than, you know, costs money to maintain. We have another question from uh, Robin Saunders, who works up in, in Southern Maine, and she's wondering uh, where your organization's funding comes from, and are there public allocations of funds, and are there development impact fees? So, to date, most of the work has, has been funded by 319 funding from EPA, from the Environmental Protection Agency, under Section 319 of the Clean Water Act. Um, there is a provision for, um, you know, the work of um, improving water quality in um, that are impaired waters, and so uh, that funding is 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 fun funneled from EPA uh, Washington into DEP and then dispersed. The original North Branch Park River Watershed Management Plan. Um, was funded by what's called an, a supplemental environmental impact study or an SEP. I don't, I've kind of forgotten the exact term, but there was a violation, um, a sewage discharge, and that triggered a violation. And that funding, um, which was about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, was divided up. You know, and and a percentage of it went to fund the engineering work and um, put uh, Park Watershed together. And that. The, the North Branch Park River Watershed Management Plan, which is available on our website, parkwatershed.org, um, it recommended there be a, a, a 501c3. So, but now I have to say, I, I must confess, I'm kind of a, I'm a designer by training. I'm a birds and butterfly person. And um, I feel that the water quality issue right now is not what's motivating people to towards conservation in the city. People actually get more excited when they see a bear or a deer or a coyote kill a, a deer in city limits, you know, than they do talking about water quality because they know it's dirty. It's like, well, we can't swim in it. And 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 the other tough thing about the North Branch in particular, and many urban rivers, is these are not recreational rivers. So the original, you know, movement to conservation was primarily, you know, the monumental wa waterways, the, the, you know, Boston Harbor, the Long Island Sound, you know, the New York Harbor, that these um, rec kind of these places that were monumental, the Connecticut River, they got the sewage out of them. But then the rivers like the Farmington River, where people can boat and fish on it, then people fall in love with those rivers and conserve those rivers. But when you can't even get out in a boat, you know, I'm, I boated down the river I, that I can drive across a distance in five minutes, it took me five hours to boat down the river this was years ago, I've never done it since, because we had to get out and portage so much over fallen trees. And, it, and most, you know, a lot of the water was very shallow. It wasn't as exciting as the Colorado River, I can tell you that. So that's part of the challenge is changing the mindset of what are we conserving in urban areas? It's not necessarily uh, a, a recreational, of course, a lot of people want a bicycle trail, but that actually just fragments the landscape further if it's right on the stream corridor. Mary, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Um, is the three are the 319 funds dispersed um, competitively in Connecticut or is there a set-aside allocation for you? Um, they're originally, evidently, much to my surprise, we were the, you know, quote unquote, first urban watershed management plan. Connecticut had been done doing a lot of planning but ignoring its cities. So when the park when the North Branch Park River Watershed Management Plan was created, 
um, there was we were a priority project and we completed you know we've done a lot of work um, it, they were not huge grants like I I talked to people you know at the annual river network conference and you know they have hundred thousand dollar grants to do implementation projects big close you know million you know um, and, and they are bigger states too but uh, the work that the funding that we've received has been smaller and kind of spread out over time um, and um, and and again it it's been useful to keep me working but it hasn't motivated my community and um, then we also got uh, we're, we're an urban bird treaty city so another source of funding was um, the um, Fish and Wildlife Service through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act has funding for, you know, for work. And, and by the way, you know, people need to weigh in with their elected officials about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because it really was one of our first laws and, and we overlook how significant that law is that's being undermined right now, but, or it's being efforts to um, reduce its impact. But that, we, so we had funding from the Urban Bird Treaty Project, and again, that link is on our website. And, and that has proven to be very um, critical to my thinking about why the trees along the riparian corridor are maybe more important than the water quality issues. Because the migratory birds depend upon the, tr the insects that live in the tree canopies that we don't even see. So most of, you know, the more mature the tree, the more the insect population has established up in the canopy of that tree. And that's what the migratory birds are coming from for. And if, if you look at an Audubon, those portfolios, you will see how Audubon um, paints a, a, a picture of birds with the vegetation that those birds prefer. So for instance, one day I was with a friend and we were walking along and there were a flock of cedar waxwings around a cedar tree. They were obviously, they were migrating, it was in the spring and they had stopped because the cedars, the cedar, um, you know, the cedar berries were, were ready. It was stunning. And I, I just realized it's all about food <laughs> you know, and 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 that the mature trees offer a, a different type of food than these these little, you know, these little saplings that are getting they're that are replacing them. Does that help? But I don't. I it must, does. I, I'm just wondering. I just feel like the work that you're doing is so important that it needs a sustainable or, or a self-sustaining revenue source. I totally and the <laughs> first thing that yeah, and the first thing that comes to mind is like um, a stormwater utility. Yeah. And you right. your organization should be forefront in whether or not Hartford and the general area has a stormwater utility because that what you're what you're doing the conservation you know i love to hear that water quality is is almost seems to be a peripheral <laughs> benefit now and that yeah. the trees are the primary sorry yeah no that's okay actually i just want to say there's a huge backstory of having my spent 10 years on the mdc that's our water and sewer authority the utility 10 years on on their citizens advisory committee and every meeting I brought up green infrastructure and we brought up a sub we had a subcommittee on green infrastructure and at that time I actually wrote an article in 2009 for the National Building Museum on green infrastructure and that's pretty much all I would ever talk about hi I'm Mary I want to talk about green infrastructure and you know nobody you know at the MDC wants to sell water they and they other people want to sell pipes and that you know um there were a lot of there were a lot of political interests that, that weren't going to have anything to do with it and in green infrastructure people have to remember it was a relatively new concept it was called low impact development and you know now i'm i'm you know i'm and and this is why you know design is so critical because wow i in in 
for instance, at the River Network in Omaha, Nebraska, I was talking to a gentleman maybe two years ago, and he said, you know, just casually over a beer, yeah, we installed like 2,500 green infrastructure bioretention basins around Omaha. You know, and so I'm from the West, and I understand, I think one of the reasons why I was drawn to green infrastructure, besides the fact I had done work on um, green roofs um, through an architectural project, uh, I, be, coming from the West, I'm very familiar with water scarcity issues and water scarcity issues across the land. And so um, that is not an issue in New England where we get 45 to 60 inches of rain a year. So again, like how do we get people excited? Who's gonna pay for it? The, wa the stormwater utility, I had an independent study student from the Trinity College write a white paper on stormwater utilities and it was distributed to the LOB, the Legislative Office um, building and um, you know the communities, there's a lot of tension around creating those utilities because people see it as a tax. And it's not, but it, it is. So anyway, a long-winded answer, but it was two decades of effort around that topic. Thanks, thanks, Mary. I wanted to um, jump in briefly to ask um, if you could talk a bit about how you're using um, the NELP scenarios in your work. Um, and I'm hoping, I think, um, I think it would be great for everyone to hear about that. And then also, if you, uh, it's, if you want to open up for um, discussion with the group about integrating scenarios into these questions about urban riparian habitats as well. Um, but first, starting with how, how you're using the scenarios. So the scenarios were just the overall New England landscape futures. I'm, I'm a designer by training, and so we are design, we, we are, tr I am trained as an envisioner to envision things in the future and I am um, so to envision in the future of the landscapes is just somebody asking me to do that is like thank you so much <laughs> um, and the scenario so what the different scenarios offer is a lot of homework by you know the NELF team in advance, right? So it shows this breakdown. And it's true, you know, those four quadrants um, are, uh, you know, in a way, stereotypes. And I think the interesting thing about having these chats that we've had was understanding that those four quadrants are like characters. And so, and, and they're, and, and, and different as you know any we could go any way we could be any one of those on different days so but we want our future to be more you know healthy green and beneficial and i can see how one i we need all the half steps so now that we've started talking about we in one of the earlier chats we talked about farmers markets and and you know how that was related to connected communities and then I, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, shade grown coffee. And so there's a coffee called Birds and Beans Coffee and it's made in New England, um, but they, they work with, um, with uh, coffee plantations where, that don't cut the trees down. So I started thinking about how we could create all these half steps that if consumers really understood the benefit of buying shade grow coffee, which isn't even sold at Whole Foods, you know, it's it's actually pretty hard to find a good shade grown coffee, um, because most consumers don't know how critical it is. But birds and beans you, hits all the dots, right? It hits local, uh, regional, um, and international, global environments, and the birds, of course, are. The beauty about migratory birds is they span that spectrum as well. So uh, that's how those scenarios have helped me is I've started to figure out all the half steps. And, and that page uh, from Voices of the Land that has, uh, see, I have, I'm going to show you my, I have, I have little um, post-it notes to adding 
so so you know the the scenarios that they developed these lines and it's hard to get it this in the focal plane but you know they they developed a whole series of of um how do we do this there of of points right and you've got to go back to those points and reread that that list and then you have to start thinking of all the half other points that fit in there so for instance do you want me to keep going i could talk forever but i like for instance because i i did all this work in green infrastructure i i noticed that you know there's generalized comments about green infrastructure in in these in these quadrants and and go it alone has decay in the infrastructure and um you know and and then it says infrastructure investments serve local needs but does that mean green infrastructure that's where i think our group our chats can say well in green infrastructure and a stormwater utility those are the steps to make to get to collect connected communities D does whereas yankee cosmopolitan might be a little bit more like the route where hartford's going is is just it's been built you know two billion dollars to build a storage tunnel I, they needed that too right and and um you know but not put any green infrastructure in so does that is that helpful yes thank you we do have one more question from the audience it's a or from the audience, it's from, the, from everyone here. Uh, this is from Jeff again. He's wondering uh, if you're if you're looking to replace non-native trees and shrubs with natives, knowing that natives have more caterpillars and probably other uh, other insects. And then again, uh, he's with natives, of course. Is yeah. That, yeah, yeah, always always native species. <laughs> always. Yeah, that actually was, um, yeah, when you get funding from the government, they usually emphasize natives. It's somehow when it gets translated to the facilities management at the campus of the Yukon Law School, they somehow are able to like overlook the native need. Um, <laughs> but I don't do that. Like all of our, our work is natives. And actually that's the beauty of the green infrastructure. I mean, we, we did install, we have installed green you know, not as many as I'd like, but there are um, large bioretention basins that capture the stormwater runoff from some parking lots. And um, it is a pleasure to watch the birds come in on those, on those plants. And uh, yeah, so, and, and, and also the pollinator pathways movement is, you know, another, I'm, I'm really happy to see um, these, these efforts because it's, it is a little tiresome to hear me, you know, people, um, different groups will say natives don't, you know, don't matter so much, but I spend a lot of time trying to remove invasive species and that's something there is not enough funding for. Um, you want me to wax on about natives? I actually have a question if that's okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, so kind of building off of Marissa's question, the thing that I, really love about your the way you're using the scenarios is that I feel like uh, one of the hot topics or in conservation is landscape conservation and landscape scale and I'll, I'll admit that the NELF scenarios they probably perform like they're kind of suited to landscape scale um, uh, you know visualization um, but you're really thinking about it from a, a very local perspective um, and in in a city um, which I mean, I think you said like some of the parks don't even show up in these pixelated maps um, because the maps just aren't maybe like the best suited for that scale. Um, and so I'm wondering, like you have your post-it note of, of half steps and I'm just wondering what's, what's next, how you, uh, how, like what's next for you in, in using the scenarios in this like very uh, pragmatic and applied way. What? I'm thinking we could have like a a wiki, you know, like a web a, or a Google spreadsheet, you know, we can all work on this together, um, you know, because Robin has suggestions. I mean, you know, we've all, I, I know other people have great ideas and, you know, bring in 
and that's what's happening in so many, um, you know, sustainability, like the municipal sustainability strategies, like Sustainable Connecticut, one of our per partners, um, you know, once those municipal staff um, enter into the program, the municipality enters into it voluntarily, and, and, but they have a criteria they have to meet. But once they're in that program, they're sharing within that program so different cities can learn from each other. And that's, of course, why we go to specialized conferences like the, the River Rally, which is the, river in, the National River Network's um, annual conference is because you you know you want to learn from people who are doing that work and and i think that what the good thing about what the nelf project is is it's given a name to that work for the conservation community right it said okay let's now we're going to think about the future of new england and so i'm sure you know we all have to carve out our our niche in that um and and you know be be within that uh, you know, I think that the framework is large enough to accept uh, the the rural areas as well as the urban areas. Awesome. Thanks. Susan has her hand raised. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, sorry, I um, had a meeting, so I missed Mary's presentation, but I wanted to respond to your last question with two two things that I think are, you know, practical ideas to move forward. So. Um, some of you may know that I'm on the um, Governor's Council on Climate Change, the co-chair of the Science and Technology Group. Actually, let me just introduce Susan. Susan's one oh, of Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Susan Messino from Trinity College. And uh, so I'm glad to hear, she didn't need to hear my presentation because she's heard it before, but yeah, go for it, Susan. Okay, thank you. Um, so one kind of landscape way that I like to use some of this um, data, which may be difficult because it's not completely up to date, but um, still there's a lot of good stuff in there, is do sort of um, overlays of the landscape. So we have really good mapping of temperature across the landscape, flooding across the landscape, carbon density across the landscape, land use across the landscape, and kind of overlay these, these things and try and get a handle on, you know, where is, you know, uh, you know, also core forest areas, things like that. So we can get a handle on, if we want to talk about green infrastructure at kind of a grand scale, we could, you know, start making strategic decisions about that. And one thing that I'd also like to do is try and use an example um, like what Mary's been doing with the Park River Watershed to show kind of the, the co-benefits by taking a, a look at a natural landscape that links between urban, suburban, and all the way out to the rural areas so that everybody could kind of imagine that in their you know, in there, wherever they live, here's a case study of how we're trying to look at all these different values. So that's, those are two kind of ways that I'm trying to move this forward, kind of at a policy level. Yeah, we want to see that connection, the connectivity, the opportunity of, of the urban, of, you know, conservation and revitalization of urban suburban corridors. Um, we want to see that co connectivity to the rural areas and the exurbs in part because you know we do want to reduce sprawl saving our cities is so critical and now we're hearing you know pan the pandemic you know everybody's going to like exit the city again but we have to save cities in order to reduce sprawl i mean i love open spaces and landscapes but i love high density urban areas they have to be designed properly so that people have access to rewild landscapes People need, you know, the nature deficit disorder, these sen which Susan can talk to more specifically because that's her work. These are, these are you know, proving to be very significant aspects of human health. And so there's a good reason why people wanted to move to the suburbs. They wanted access to nature. And a lot of the, a lot of the kind of economic development teams will say schools, transportation, safety, Right. It's well, a lot of people move to the suburbs for nature, you know, but they but they don't get it right. They just 
get it from their car window. So this picture, and I'm gonna let Susan speak about that in a minute, but this picture, I just wanna mention that this sort of last picture, this thank you picture, the University of Massachusetts, uh, uh, I had a studio on, um, you know, where I brought students to, to Hartford. And this is in 2004, this picture that Lauren created. And the, um, again, the, the Park River was buried in Bushnell Park. And so she reimagined, you know, a wetland. And now you'd call it a pollinator pathway, you know, because the water still goes to where that, where that river was. And um, this is a very crude image, but I, I'm, one of the things I had suggested to Marissa is maybe in the future we all bring a picture of what we think are connected, you know, our connected communities or that greener future those designed areas would be because in we're all, you know, it's almost like um, interior designers, they begin by bringing pictures and and cuttings and textures and colors and putting it kind of on a collage board together. And, you know, we, we can do that work here. So anyway, Susan can talk about that, why the health benefits. Oh, thanks, Mary. I didn't really have anything planned to talk about that, but there is more and more evidence coming out. And in fact, you know, I'm giving a talk tonight on forests and brain health. I can post the link if people are interested. I can post that in the chat. Uh, chat. Um, is it, yeah. is it, is the, that's not the, is it open to public? Yeah, you can register and you can, you can, you can go. Um, yeah, I'll post it in the link. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, the health is a big issue. I mean, what, what's happened with this pandemic, um, you know, given the, um, you know, it's a respiratory illness, uh, it's, a, it's, you know, there's stress, uh, then uh, this message of, of, the, of nature, uh, this, the solace, the, the health benefits of nature, that can't be downplayed in the city. That's, that's high up there. On, in, in, in value. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you everyone for, um, for the discussion, for your thoughts and questions. Um, I want to briefly highlight that in the chat, uh, see the chat because um, Susan has put the link to her talk this evening and also um, Heidi shared a link um, with more information about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, which is a policy concern that um, that Mary brought up during our conversation. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. So see those resources um, and we'll we'll put them in the uh, we'll put the link that Heidi shared in, in the notes from from this conversation, though um, it'll be probably the notes will go out a little too late to see Susan's talk. So so save that link now um, from Susan. And um, as as always, we'll follow up with notes from from this uh, from our conversation today, and um, we'll be hosting another uh, another NELF chat next month. Um, so stay tuned for the details and the announcements on that. And thank you all for for discussing and um, for for sharing ideas in community. Thank you. Thanks, Mary and everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording now and end the meeting. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Until next time.